Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Steven Roth and I'm a board certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist. And today we'll be talking about one of the most frequent conditions that I see in my practice, burning mouse syndrome. But first, we have to go over the disclaimer and that is that all of the opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone and do not represent any of the organizations that employ me or that I may be a part of and that also this video is for educational purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. Should you have any concerns about your oral health, please consult your nearest oral health care provider. And with that being said, let's get into today's video. So today we'll be covering a pretty complex topic and that's burning mouse syndrome. It's something that I see fairly commonly in my practice and it can be very frustrating for patients and providers alike. So today we'll be talking about what burning mouse syndrome is, what it is not, and how it can be approached. Burning mouse syndrome is likely a peripheral neuropathy, meaning that it affects the nerves of the oral cavity. It used to be called burning tongue syndrome because the tongue is primarily affected, but we now know that it can affect any site in the oral cavity. It mostly affects peri and postmenopausal women, which is definitely true in my practice, but I've also seen it affect many people outside of that range, including younger people and men as well. Burning mouse syndrome has three major symptomatic findings. The first being change in pain sensation. And many patients say that they feel like they burned their mouth or they scalded it with a hot tea or coffee. Some say that it feels like it's constantly being stabbed with a pen. And that is mostly the, the change in pain sensation. The next is change in textural sensation. And we see that most commonly as saying, uh, a patient saying that I feel like my mouth is dry. I feel like I'm not producing enough saliva. When we do an exam, we see that they are, that their salivary production levels are within normal limits. Other patients say that they feel like they've got cotton in their mouth or cat hair. Uh, one patient said that they feel like they've got rice coming out of their teeth, but that is change in textural sensation. And then finally, we've got change in taste sensations. And that can be diminished taste where things don't taste uh, quite the same or, or, or uh, to the same extent that it did before. They can't taste their food, but it can also be a uh, maltaste, such as I feel like uh, my teeth, everything tastes sour, or I feel like uh, you know this tastes metallic. So those are the three symptomatic findings, change in pain sensations, texture sensations, and taste sensations. And a patient may have one of those changes, all three, or a combination therein. Many patients find that these symptoms aren't too bad in the morning and then progress throughout the day. And some patients are in such profound pain that they can't sleep at night. The important thing about burning mouse syndrome is that it's a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that everything else has been ruled out. Burning mouse syndrome is not an infection, an autoimmune disease. It doesn't represent underlying neoplasia or cancer. It's not a vitamin deficiency. It's not a hormone deficiency. It really is in a category in and of itself. And while we're not really sure why it happens, a lot of, of research and study has gone into it and kind of the best guess that we have is that it's a peripheral neuropathy. Many patients will try to pinpoint a specific event like a dental procedure or a specific meal and we believe that this is most likely coincidental rather than having a direct cause for the patient's pain that it just so happened that the condition started after seeing the dentist or after eating a certain thing or traveling to a certain place and it's likely unrelated. This article is really helpful in discussing tongue pathology, including burning mouse syndrome. It goes over all of the different visual pathologies that we can see that we have to rule out before we have a discussion with patients about burning mouse syndrome and make that diagnosis. Again, because burning mouse syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that we don't see any visual pathologic change within the patient. So is biopsy helpful? Well, no, not outside an academic setting. 
Certain research, like this paper, have identified that patients with burning mouse syndrome have a lower density of epithelial nerve fibers, but this involves a lot of really expensive tests and using different stains and studies on the biopsy tissue that we don't really have at our disposal in the real world. So at the end of the day, if a biopsy is performed on this patient, then a lot of times we're introducing more risk to the patient when really burning mouse syndrome can be made, uh, the diagnosis can be made based on correlation of symptoms and history and also the lack of findings in the oral cavity. If we do a biopsy, we have to be conscious that we can cause more pain to the patient, we could potentially introduce infection in that patient, and then we can also cause nerve damage, salivary gland damage. So really we try to reserve biopsy for when we need the assistance in making a diagnosis, and in burning mouse syndrome, we don't really need that assistance. That diagnosis is made with the lack of visual findings and a correlation of symptoms. The typical culprits that are blamed when a provider isn't familiar with burning mouse syndrome include a vitamin deficiency, which again, we're going to visually see change to the oral mucosa if the patient has a vitamin deficiency. In addition, allergy is often blamed, but just like vitamin deficiency, we're going to see a change if there's a contact stomatitis or a systemic allergy to a new agent in the patient's diet. And these two, Diagnoses can lead to a lot of expensive tests that bring uncertainty to the patient. And finally, the last culprit that tries to get blamed is yeast. Now, Candida albicans and, and the Candida species are commensal organisms, meaning that they live naturally in the oral cavity of some people. So if we were to go and do a yeast culture in the vast majority of people in the world, about a third of them are going to have a positive culture, meaning they have yeast in their mouth. But that doesn't mean that they're symptomatic. The yeast is just there living a happy life and not causing any issues. If there is a candidal overgrowth, that's when patients start having symptoms. In the case of thrush or pseudomembranous candidiasis, patients get cheesy cottage cheese-like plaques that are wipeable from their mucosa, and erythematous candidiasis, which is often the one with the most symptoms, patients will have a lot of redness in their oral cavity. And that's when we have to worry about yeast. In addition, a coated tongue or a white tongue is unrelated to yeast. A lot of times a coated tongue is thought to be a yeast overgrowth when really it's probably an altered diet from the patient where they're eating softer foods and they're not getting rid of the keratin, which is the surface uh, cells and the food debris and the bacteria that lives naturally on the tongue and so it looks more white. So what can be done for these patients? Well, luckily, burning mouse syndrome is a good news, bad news, good news diagnosis. And we already discussed the first good news, and that is that burning mouse syndrome doesn't represent some insidious underlying pathology like a cancer or an infection or an autoimmune disease. The bad news is that we don't really have any good ways to treat burning mouth syndrome. Now, this is gonna be a very controversial part of this video because many people will claim that they have a miracle cure that will solve this in every patient, and the scientific literature has not really found that to be the case. It's really important that a professional has the treatment plans and has a treatment philosophy based in the scientific literature that has undergone extensive peer-reviewed testing because we want to make sure that we have proven actual treatments for our patients and their conditions. And unfortunately, in the case of burning mouse syndrome, that isn't the case. This review by Drs. Ritchie and Kramer is excellent in discussing some of the modalities that are being used and the support behind it or lack thereof. These include a topical clonazepam wafer, a systemic clonazepam, gabapentin, alpha-lipoic acid, melatonin, low-level laser therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy. And while some of these do have some success, 
It is important to remember that some of these treatments do have pretty significant side effects, especially the systemic treatments where patients taking an antidepressant or anti-epileptic, they may have side effects from the medication that is actually worse than the condition itself. So sometimes in my patients, if I feel like it will be of a benefit to them, I may suggest a natural treatment that has some evidence or basis in the scientific literature, such as an alpha lipoic acid or melatonin, with their understanding that it may not work for them. Some patients, it works very well, and some, it just doesn't. And if the patients have that expectation, then I feel a little bit more comfortable prescribing something that is naturally made by the body that won't have significant side effects and potentially cause more damage. There are plenty of practitioners out there that are familiar with this condition that do like to use systemic medication, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But it is important if you are going to use a systemic medication with the potential for side effects to follow these patients very closely to make sure that the side effects are tolerable to them. One interesting treatment modality that uh, I will briefly discuss that I don't necessarily recommend but is used is the use of capsation, which is what gives hot peppers their heat. And the suggestion is that a patient uses a capsation tablet or even a hot pepper itself to desensitize the tongue. And this basically puts the patient in more pain and attempts to get them out of pain, which may or may not be successful. So over time, the hot pepper heat kind of tampens uh, or damps down the, the nerve misfiring and eventually that patient's nerve kind of gets desensitized to that burning sensation. This is not something that I necessarily recommend, but is out there in the scientific literature. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a great resource for these patients, not because it magically cures their pain, but it does help them with ways to cope. In fact, many of these patients will report a lessening of symptoms when they're on vacation or when they're doing something that they enjoy. In fact, one of my patients recently told me that her symptoms subside when she's playing with her grandchildren. So these patients really benefit from the cognitive behavioral therapy where they can process this really distressing, this really distressing condition that they, that they have. And through that, they are able to find ways and mechanisms to live a very happy and full life. Again, the treatment modalities that I listed and that are in the paper from Drs. Ritchie and Kramer are based on scientific literature. The internet is both a wonderful and an awful place. If you search the internet, there are many miracle cures that you'll see on chat rooms and from quote unquote experts that will solve burning mouth syndrome in everyone. And unfortunately, that just isn't supported by the scientific literature. I know this is a little ironic coming from a YouTube video, and that's why, again, this is for educational purposes only. If you feel that you have burning mouth syndrome or you have a patient with burning mouth syndrome, it's really important that they get evaluated by someone comfortable with this condition. This could be your clinical oral pathologist, your oral medicine specialist, or oral facial pain specialist. Back to the good news. For the majority of patients, this condition subsides over time, just as mysteriously as it popped up. This may happen gradually over time, or maybe just like flicking a light switch where one day they wake up and they're completely out of pain. There are unfortunately some patients that do live with this condition for the remainder of their life and that's when the cognitive behavioral therapy may be helpful with having them helping them cope. But for the majority of patients in maybe weeks, maybe months, maybe years, they do find that this condition does subside. The important thing is to reassure these patients that they are not crazy. Many of these patients see multiple providers that may or may not be familiar with this condition. They may have tried nine or 10 different treatment modalities, antifungals, um, different nerve blocking agents, or may have just been told that there's nothing wrong with them. And that isn't the case. This is a very real condition. It is repeatable, it is something that we see in practice, it has a demographic, it has common symptomology amongst all of the patients that have this condition, and it is real. It is important that these patients don't feel isolated and that they feel heard. 
Many of my patients feel instant relief when I tell them I know what's going on, that I've seen it in other people, and that their experience is valid and is based in reality. This is a very, very difficult condition uh, for patients and providers alike. I really wish that I had some magic cure for these patients to relieve their pain because it is a very real uh, and very difficult pain experience. But I do find that cognitive behavioral therapy with coping does help. And then in addition, just telling the patient about the condition and that it doesn't represent anything worse uh, helps patients find relief in a large portion of these patients. Burning mouth syndrome is a very complex topic and I could probably double or triple the length of this video talking more about it. So if you do have any questions or concerns, I really recommend reaching out to your nearest clinical oral pathologist, oral medicine specialist, or oral facial pain specialist for more information. Thanks again for watching today's video. I hope that you found it helpful. And if you did, please share it with someone else that may find it helpful as well. Don't forget to like and subscribe and be well.